Happy Snow Day, and welcome to some notes. Um, we're going to be looking at chapter 13 here next, and it's uh, looking at rates of reaction. And I'm sure you know that chemical reactions require different amounts of time. Some are very, very fast. Some are very, very slow. And so what we have are chemical kinetics, which is the study of reaction rates and how reactions change under varying conditions. And then what molecular events occur during the overall reaction. So that's what the chemical kinetics is looking at. What's important here is because by noting how the rate of a reaction is affected by certain changing conditions, then we can start to learn what is happening at the molecular level. We always want to know what's happening at the molecular level. And we'll look at some of those theories as we progress through this unit. So first up, what we're going to do is look at rates of reaction and the variables of these affecting reaction rates. And we're actually going to be doing a lab with this. But first off, the concentration of reactants has an effect. The rate of reaction is often increased when the concentration of a reactant is increased. You can see some diagrams down here. On the left there, the red ball colliding with a blue ball will create a, a desired chemical reaction. So obviously, the more of both of those there are, then the more likely product is going to be formed. And this has to do with, well, we're going to study later called the collision theory and you can see that pictured on the right. If we have a low concentration, less collisions, high concentration, more collisions, which we'll see typically has a tie-in to forming more products. Although as it says there, some reactions only require that a little bit of a reactant be present and it's not going to affect the rate depending on that particular reactant's concentration. And we'll see some examples of that. Our next one, let me check, yep. Our next variable is the surface area of a solid reactant. If we have a solid reactant, typically reacting in a liquid or a gas, the reaction is occurring at the surface of the solid. So the more surface area there is, the faster the reaction is going to proceed. And so here's some diagrams for you, if you will. If we have a large chip of marble reacting with acid, that's what those little red circles are representing, then we're going to get a certain rate, but our rate will be faster if we bust that marble chip up. Okay, so typically if you take a, a solid and pulverize it and crush it, you know, if you're trying to dissolve sugar into your iced tea and it's given to you as a cube, then typically you're going to smash the cube up and get it to dissolve faster. And you see that graphically represented there. Just the fact that, you know, eventually you're going to hit a plateau as far as the reaction rate is concerned, but the reaction will proceed much faster when we have a greater surface area of our solid reactant. Next up we have temperature. Ooh, I know, fun diagram. Particles that are cold move slower. Particles that are hot move faster. It's a reflection of kinetic energy. And here you see our lovely graph that we've seen a couple different times. Okay, T2 is greater even though the hump is smaller the average kinetic energy is higher than our lower temperature T1. But over here is where the important stuff is. And that's again where we see the molecules with enough kinetic energy to react. And you see at the higher temperature there's more molecules that have that kinetic energy. So as we see usually reactions speed up when the temperature is increased. Again, this lovely diagram shows us that there are more molecules that have enough kinetic energy to react than when we're at a lower temperature. Last, we're going to look at catalysts, and I'm sure you've heard about these before, but they are substances that increase the rate of a reaction without actually being consumed in the overall reaction. So here you see the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. And one of the catalysts that can speed that up is light, which is why hydrogen peroxide is typically stored in a brown, dark container, but also this manganese dioxide. And so it is written above the arrow showing that it is a catalyst. It's helpful and important to the reaction, but actually not used in the reaction. And we'll study this lovely diagram later, but you can see it's what's called an activation energy and a reaction without a catalyst is going to take much more energy to get going 
than a reaction with catalysts. And that's going to be the focus when we start talking about those. But right now we're going to look at reaction rates. And what reaction rates are is, you know, a reflection of how fast a reaction is, is going. And how we typically look at them is through the increase in molar concentration of a product or a decrease in molar concentration of reactant per unit time. So, of course, our good friend molarity, moles per liter, is our best known and used reflection of concentration. And so moles per liter second is how that's typically written out. It can be written out the long way or moles per liter second. An important notation, when something is in brackets, we're talking about its molar concentration. So there's going to be brackets all over the place in this unit, but that's telling us that we're looking at the molar concentration of whatever is in the bracket. So when we're talking about a reaction rate, we can say that the average reaction rate is the change in molar concentration, delta, over the change in time. And that's not very unfamiliar to us. Here we can say a car is traveling 84 miles in two hours. What was its average rate of travel? 84 miles divided by two hours, that's 42 miles per hour. That was its average rate of travel. Now, at any given moment, it might not be traveling that way. It could be at a stop sign, it could be on the highway going 80, it could be on a side street going 30. But overall, the average rate was 42 miles per hour. So there is some importance to these average rates of reaction. So here we see the decomposition of dinitrogen pentoxide. And here's some data about that decomposition. You know, you start the reaction. After 600 seconds, we see the concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide, 1.24 times 10 to the negative 2 molar. 600 seconds later, it's down to 0.93 times 10 to the negative second molar. So if I want to find the average rate of reaction, since the concentration is decreasing, I say that it's negative, and then I do my delta. I subtract the 1,200 minus the 600. So I subtract my concentrations on top, subtract my time on the bottom, and I see that it ends up with an average rate of reaction of 5.2 times 10 to the negative 6 molar per second. I don't know how you really want to say that, but moles per liter second is how it usually is said. And just as a note, when we're talking about rates and they're expressed in reactant terms, we say they are negative because as I was saying, the reactants are decreasing so it makes sense to say that the rates are positive, that the reaction is proceeding at a certain rate. So that's just a little notation to make note of. To get uh, the rate of a reaction, you must do so experimentally. So in order to do that, you must determine the concentration of reactant or concentration of product during the course of the reaction. If a reaction is slow enough, then we can easily take different samples of the reactant or just take samples of the reaction and measure the concentration of reactant or product at certain times. If it's a gaseous reaction, then we can monitor this through pressure changes because more collisions, more part or more particles, more collisions, more pressure, etc. We can also monitor if, if there's color changes, like with our spectrometer or colorimeters, if we have a visible color change. Or an infrared or nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Those are some other forms of analysis that you can use with absorption if our color change is not visible. If it's in the infrared or ultraviolet spectrums. So and you can look into those. Hopefully some of you might actually use some of those techniques in later chemistry courses. All right. That's going to take us up to 13.3. I'm going to stop this video here and just do a separate other one uh, for that section, just in case we go slightly over 15 minutes. I'll try not to, but all right, I'll check you in the next video.